idea. Right now, William Taylor, let's check in, find out what's happening with uh, Hurricane Dennis. William, how are you, sir? All righty. I just been, I've been getting more phone calls today than the telephone. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. You're so, popular. Well, anyway, we'll start off with the latest update, which was 1 o'clock. 22.1 north, 80.6 west, now moving inland on the south-central coast of Cuba, which is a relatively mountainous portion. The earlier model, of the forecast track, rather, had it going wet just west of Havana. On this track, it'll probably go, it's going inland east of Havana. So it's taken somewhat of a more northwest to north-northwest track over, over the, uh, mm -hmm. the island nation. Now, because of the mountainous terrain, it's not out of the question that Dennis could wobble one way or the other, okay? But overall, it is staying just to the east of the forecast track. So if it does wobble, I don't think to the left, that won't be a serious issue. Okay. And all the models keep it going. Right now it's moving northwest at 17. Yeah, it picked up a little. That's the fastest I think it has gone since mm -hmm. it's become a hurricane. Uh, winds only down a little. It was 150. It's now 145. Pressure has fallen to 27.79 inches of mercury. So it is it is staying as a relatively deep system. Um, okay, so anyway, here here's what we got for the model update. They keep it moving on an angle between 305 and 315 degrees, which, of course, 315 is pure northwest. Right. At the 10 o'clock model update, uh, excuse me, I keep saying that. I'm using terms like crazy today. Forecast track keeps it going on the old track from 4 a.m., which by Sunday, late Sunday afternoon puts landfall at or just to the east of Pensacola. And as a category, a borderline 3 to 4, with winds in the neighborhood of 135 miles an hour. So, And unfortunately, if it holds that strength, um, you could be looking at storm surge in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 feet mm -hmm. at, and to the, and at and to about 30 miles east of where it goes inland. Are there any highs, lows, troughs, anything yes. that okay. could have a significant impact? Uh, right now, that's what's steering it. The high pressure, mid-level ridge, because for folks who may not know, it's, it's the mid-levels of the atmosphere that steers these things. Okay. Mid-level high on the western Atlantic, which we all used to call the Bermuda Ridge, it's barely bridging across the Florida Peninsula. There's an upper trough across the South Central Plains diving down into northern Mexico that is totally across Louisiana and Mississippi right now, and it's going to stay there. In fact, the thunderstorms we're having in, in, in the southern part mm -hmm. of the state today is from daytime heating and that trough. So what happens is this creates a, a passageway between the western end of the high and the eastern front of the trough, just like pouring water down into a ditch, this would be the path that the storm would go to. Oh, okay. Okay, that's the best analogy I can give. And um, so that's why it has stayed steady. Now, off the air, Ricky brought out something I'd like to clarify. It's a bit of a confusion. As you know, Don, there are some free websites up, out there right. that show the computer model. Mm -hmm. that are updated every six hours. One of them called the United Kingdom Meteorology Model, or UCMET, as we call it, has, has been putting the system across southeast Louisiana. Yeah, for days. Right. Yeah. And there's another one called the GFS, which we used to call the av Aviation Model, which has been way to the east. Um, that particular, the, the, the website that has five of the models, what people may not know is this. The Hurricane Center... They normally throw out the left and right bias model yeah, yeah. and go by what's in the middle. However, those aren't the only five computer models they go by. There's as many as 15 of them that they go by and take a consensus mm -hmm. from. But they don't put all 15 on those free yeah. websites because it would look like spaghetti. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Right. So for folks going to these free websites, don't focus solely on the oh. ones way to the left or the one way to, way to yeah. the right. Ignore the two extremes. Right. Go by the consensus in the middle. That's what the Hurricane Center has always done. So when, and, in fact, these models are picking up on the trough to the left and the ridge to the right. Mm -hmm. So that's why the Hurricane Center has stuck with this forecast track. And so far, it's likely to stay this way, and I don't expect a major change at the 4 o'clock update. 
All right. We'll check with you next hour, bud. All right, no problem. Thank you so much. All right, so long. Mm -hmm. Meteorologist William Taylor keeping us up to date on Hurricane Dennis. I now a former state trooper, Richard Wallace, is joining us, and we're going to talk about speeding tickets. Yes, speeding tickets. We've all got one some one time or another. And um, he's got some advice on uh, how to beat them and how to to those who have been driving around, many of you possibly already getting out of southeast Louisiana as uh, Hurricane Dennis moving northwestward right now. Dennis has made landfall in western Cuba. President Fidel Castro reports 10 people there have died. Let's bring in uh, William Taylor, who knows quite a bit about the weather and uh, hurricanes. He's down in uh, Thibodeau. And William, right now, it, it still seems at this point, uh, and we're crossing our fingers here in the Bayou State, that this deadly storm is going to stay to the east of us. What do you think? Uh, the way it looks right now, uh, more than likely, yes. In fact, the 4 o'clock updated track has shifted about 6 to 12 miles further east. Mm. Now inland, uh, it should move inland Sunday afternoon east of Pensacola in the Destin area. Wow. The good news is for us, obviously not for some others, the high-pressure ridge in the western Atlantic bridging the Florida Peninsula is weakening. That was the main steer steering mechanism to the east, which means the big trough across south Texas, east Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi is staying put. That's creating southwesterly winds in the mid-levels, forcing this thing to go northwest and eventually north when it gets to the northern periphery of the, of the Gulf of Mexico. So all those things put together now, and that should stay for the next 48 hours, it will likely move inland well east of Louisiana. Uh, Hurricane Watch is in effect from the mouth of the Pearl River eastward all the way to the Steinhatchee River in Florida. And the biggest weather concern now for southeast Louisiana will be Saturday night and into Sunday. Our coastal waters east of the mouth of the Mississippi River will have tropical storm force winds. Mm -hmm. But that will be 20 to 60 miles offshore. Yeah. High tides would be the biggest concern east of the mouth of the Mississippi River, two to three feet above normal. But otherwise, I think most of Louisiana is going to come out of this okay. I, it seems like to me, William, that um, maybe by Saturday at noon, we're going to have a we're going to have a good idea whether this thing's going to come this way or not. It, it, that's the way it just seems to me. What do you think? Uh, yeah, if not already. Yeah. And I say that because the cone of error, as they call it, has shrunk. Louisiana is basically out of it now. Uh -huh. and so if this thing doesn't radically wobble, which it, it, I mean, it, it, can, it will over Cuba because of the mountains. Mm -hmm. But when it reemerges, likely east of Havana, uh, it should continue on that northwesterly and then north northwesterly track because, like I said, that trough is staying put to the west of us, high weakening to the east. By default, it would tend to go more eastward than westward. So I'm very confident. But as we go through tonight, and especially tomorrow morning, the fix on it will be even better. All right. Well, thanks a lot, William. We, usually we talk to you about Saints football. So give me a prediction this year. Give me a record. Win-loss total. Well, the one I gave Don Grady a week and a half ago was 9-7. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, if they keep their head in the game, like they did the last four games, no reason why they shouldn't. And we'll see what happens. All right. We'll, get, uh, we'll talk to you soon here in a couple of weeks as training camp will fire up in less than a month. Can you believe it? Hard to believe. Yep. Thanks, lo thanks a lot, William. All righty. All right. And good news from William Taylor. But I, I still feel bad for those folks in Pensacola. All right. We'll see you next Friday, everyone. Hopefully we'll survive the storm. Prices, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some of them do. Some, some of them you have that. to ask. Yeah, but see, William Taylor, he's he's rolling in the bucks. He doesn't oh, yeah. care. He looks at venues Never. that don't have prices because he doesn't care. Isn't that right? Yeah, especially if it's a Happy Meal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how you doing, William? Well, actually, you know, it's kind of a sad day today. Why? I picked up the paper, and um, three noteworthy people uh, passed away with Louisiana ties that I was a little familiar with. Okay. I was sorry to see that Mr. James No Jr. Right. Uh, passed away. Uh, I was an intern at Channel 8 Television in Monroe in 1992 uh, in the weather department under Neil Shaw. Uh, I didn't get to know Mr. No, but uh, yeah, I knew of his name very well. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, also, one of the last family-owned conglomerates in the country. 
Yeah, and it's quite amazing. Uh, and uh, and the, it was always um, a real solid place to mm -hmm. go visit and work for up there in Monroe. Also, uh, Mr. Robert Monstead, 91 years old, died. Uh, an established businessman and World War II veteran from New Orleans, but he was an original minority owner of the Saints. And okay. finally, for, if you're a music fan, you remember 1956, the hit Let the Good Times Roll? Of course. Well, that was read about it. <laughs> right. Well, that was done by, uh, one version was done by a group called Shirley and Lee. Right. Well, Miss Shirley from the group passed away, Shirley Goodman Pixley, and you're she was kidding. also from New Orleans. Yeah, I didn't hear that. Yeah, she was 69 years old. The the Mr. Lee from the group, he unfortunately died in 76. Uh -huh. So, yeah, just uh, it was real incredible reading all that in the paper today. Not a great week. No, nah, but we were lucky. At least we didn't have to worry about Dennis. Yeah, and that's the truth. However, Emily's kind of got a bunch of people scratching their heads wondering what she's going to do. Yeah, it's still a tropical storm, rather disorganized. And one reason why is because it's moving so fast to the west at about 20. Mm -hmm. The theory is sometimes, it, as a tropical storm, if they move that quickly in a forward direction, sometimes their upper structure can't keep up with it. Oh, okay. Uh, but however, if it becomes a hurricane, throw all that out the window. Now, there's even a chance it could run into South America. But if it doesn't do that, then... There is a good chance if it stays below 20 degrees north latitude, right mm -hmm. now it's on about 11. Yeah, I'm looking uh, it, at the map right now. Yeah, it could just run flat into Central America, and uh, we may never have to worry about it. Yeah, but if it crosses Yucatan, then it could get into the Gulf, and then yeah. if it heads northeast any degree. Yeah. yeah. So, well, well, what I think, my, we'll have a better read in two days. Sure. But if it does cross the Yucatan, if it, if it, stays below that 20 degrees north latitude span, mm -hmm. there's a good chance it will briefly get back over water, but then go back into mainland Mexico. Ah. So, if, like I said, the key for all of us to watch is how far it stays below 20 degrees north. If it stays below that line its entire trek, we, should, there, we shouldn't have a worry mm -hmm. about it recurving. Yeah, it would stay. It was on Dennis's track, and then over the past 24 hours, it kind of strayed from that and went more south. Yeah, high pressure is doing a good job at keeping it on a, on almost a due west, if not west-southwest track. Lower it stays, the less chance of recurvature. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'll be looking at over the next two days. And then on Friday, that, that famous cone of era should start shrinking uh, if it heads towards Central America. Yeah. So then I'll, I'll start to feel a little bit better about it. I hear there's at least one other system behind this puppy out in the Atlantic. Yeah, it's... I think, to my knowledge, it's still a tropical wave, yeah. uh, not a depression yet. Because people have to remember, we average about 100 tropical waves off the coast of Africa every year. And on average, only about 10 to 15 percent of them turn into anything. Mm -hmm. So there's always at least an 85 percent chance that a wave coming off of Africa, Africa just fizzles out. I'm just curious, and you probably don't know because I didn't warn you ahead of time I was going to ask, mm -hmm. but I wonder if we've ever gone through a storm season where we used up all the letters. It, we came close, I think, in, way back in 1950. But don't hold me to that, but it was mm -hmm. real early when we started naming the storm right. that, that we almost had to use a, a second rotation. Uh, but not since 1950 yeah. have we, I think the most we've ever had in the Atlantic in one year was 21. Yeah, that's still a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they don't use, they don't use Z, Q, and what are the other, there are like three or four letters they don't use. They don't use X. X, okay. And there's another we're forgetting. But for sure, we don't, they don't use Q. They don't, I think they don't use U either. It may be. And then that, that would make it up because they don't use Z. Yeah. And, and I don't think they use Y. Yeah. So I, I think I think those are the ones they don't use. So we'll know more by the weekend where this little guy may go or not go. Exactly. But uh, I'm really not really worrying about it right now. Mm -hmm. I think there, if it ever got in the Gulf, the earliest we'd have to worry is Monday. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll accept you at your word. Let's talk about the Saints. Not mm -hmm. far away. Hard to believe we're already, today's the 13th, which, by the way, tomorrow is Father's birthday. Well, what are you buying? Oh, I don't know yet. We, uh, he already has so much. You know, a man with so much sawdust like he does, you know, <laughs> he doesn't need much else. But, um, no, but beware. Whenever they say, don't get me anything, I've got all I need, you darn well better show up with something on the birthday. That's right. And because, uh, ironically, Uncle Larry's birthday is on the same day, so 
Uh, it'll, I guess there will be a handful of buying tomorrow. Boy, the merchants are going to love you tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll have more prizes than Bob Barker. <laughs> but, um, well, we got analogies like crazy today. Yeah. Are the, uh, are the Saints ready for the season? Well, let's hope so. It's, uh, I think training camp is less than two weeks away now, yeah. and I think since 2003 they've elected to have it at their facilities in Metairie prior to that three years in Thibodeau. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, like I said, they, we have an encouraging draft uh, uh, selection of draft choices this year. They're pretty close to signing their first-round pick, Jamal Brown, the Outland Trophy winner from the University of Oklahoma. That award usually goes to the best offensive lineman in all of college football. So uh, that's, that's promising in and of itself. They brought in uh, this fellow Newberry from Philadelphia also to be on the offensive line. So if they get plugged side-by-side side each other, I'll feel better about the offensive line. Now I think everybody, everybody I talk to says, hey, it's now all up to Aaron Brooks. We know Deuce McAllister can do the job. We know Joe Horn can do the job. A little shaky at the tight end position. You know, Boo Williams last year was kind of so-so. So they're going to put it all on Aaron? Um, I hate to say this, but I, I think this is going to have to be his make-or-break year. That, I really think his job and Jim Haslett's job is, is on his shoulders. Mm-hmm. Now, however... If the defense doesn't pick it up, then everything I just said you can throw out the window. <laughs> you know, Jonathan Sullivan has been a very disappointing number one pick from two years ago. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, uh, from what I gather, he's basically, ever since he got that nice big signing bonus two years ago, uh, his love for football has really died. I mean, last year I think he really could have played if his heart was in the game. But, you know, basically Hazlitt, for some reason, is letting uh, Sullivan act like um, – a big nothing, and so most of last year he rode the bench, and the defensive line struggled because of it. So why would uh, Haslett do that? Why would he allow well, that to happen? Well, here's the problem. Here's part of the problem. Uh, these players today, especially number one picks, get a huge signing bonus. Mm-hmm. and you They can't... don't have to do anything. You know, well, here's the thing, though. The problem is under the salary cap, if you cut, let's say, Jonathan Sullivan today, the rest of his signing bonus is going to count against next year's salary, and that would be a huge hit. So unless they found another team crazy enough to trade for him and pick up that you know, salary cap hit, yeah. uh, in a sense, they're stuck with him. Hmm. So now, Jonathan Sullivan is, one, in fact, one of his college teammates is current Saints defensive end Charles Grant. And he said, hey, you know, we all know he can do the job. It's just now all up to him if he still wants to play football. Well, is it up to him or is it up to Hazlitt? Uh, maybe a little of both. But that doggone salary cap, is what prevents, you know, prevents coaches from getting rid of the uh, mm-hmm. trouble players like this. So whose idea was the salary cap? Uh, well, came I, out of the well, the salary cap is league wide. Yeah, and but it came out of the it came out of uh, what the players or the league? Uh, I think both. It oh. was a compromise reached starting in the '94 season to basically try to balance salaries out. You know, so so the richer teams don't have an unfair advantage mm-hmm. over the smaller teams. Mm, makes sense. But. Unfortunately, when they put it into rule, there are so many loopholes, and the, sa- the signing bonus is one of them. Mm. See, the signing bonus, I, if it would count against the first year of a guy's contract, it would be one thing. The problem is it counts against the full length of the contract. So that's how these owners try to get, get around the, the rich and the poor rule. Yeah, all right. Well, William, hold that thought. Talk some more about the Saints. Saints expert William Taylor with us and meteorologist extraordinaire. Our conversation continues. Member audio streaming of our program available on the Internet, www.louisianalive.net. We're talking Saints football. William Taylor is our guest. You've always been interested in football, huh? Yeah, it goes back to, uh, hard to believe, but I'm 36 now. Okay. And it goes back to when I was 10, 1979. I don't know if I've ever told you all this story on the air, but um, that was the first year I started watching Saints football on a regular basis. And I guess around that time, actually it was the next year when I was in sixth grade, uh, I had a science teacher at St. Charles Elementary School, which is between Thibodeau and Raceland. His name was Mr. Acosta. And he'd always get on my case. I know he wasn't doing this, but he claimed he would take my advice that the Saints were going to win, and he claimed he was going uh, going to see his bookie to bet on the game. <laughs> ah, and, he wouldn't do that. Yeah, well, but, but what it is, every time the Saints didn't win or didn't cover the spread, he'd get on my case about it. Mm-hmm. And that became a running joke when I was in sixth and seventh grade. And it kind of stuck with me for the rest of my life. 
a lot of people in elementary school, junior high and high school, thought I was going to be the next Jimmy the Greek Snyder. Oh, boy. Now, but of course, as you know, starting last year, I let Vanessa do that for me. That's true. Boy. And, you know, she actually, she did something I never did. She finished a football season with, with a winning record. Uh, she, accounting the Super Bowl, she just got over 50% of, of the games correct. Now, if you're going to be a pro as an odds maker, I, I was told you need to get at least 60% right. Yeah. So these guys in Vegas really know what they're doing, in my opinion. But that's where it all started with me. And, of course, when I was following the Saints starting in 78, 79, they had the best offense they ever had with Archie Manning, Tony Galbraith, Chuck Muncie, Wes Chandler, Henry Childs. Uh, it was an incredible offense. They just didn't have the defense to match it. And, of course, ironically, you, you, we bring this up. We, uh, we mentioned earlier, of course, uh, in the week about Hank Stram passing That's away. Right. And he was our coach for two years, 76 and 77. And doggone it, we just didn't have the talent here that he had had in Kansas City where he won a Super Bowl. And, um, but, however, he brought a lot of innovations to the table, including what's called the, the, the moving pocket. Okay. It's a true story that in 1962 with the Dallas Texans, who later became the Kansas City Chiefs, they had to go to San Diego and play the Chargers. And you probably know one of their big defensive ends uh, was Ernie Ladd. Okay. And what happened, Ernie was so huge that Lenny Dawson had a hard time staying in the pocket, you know, because this guy, was this big old guy was coming after him. So Hank Stram designed the moving pocket so that the offensive line could move with Lenny Dawson so they could for, so they give him a few extra s a seconds to avoid Ernie Ladd. And that way, Lenny would have more time to throw the ball. So that's how the moving pocket was designed by Hank. And he also created stack defense, which is where you put anywhere from three to seven men up on the defensive line. And then when the ball is snapped, some of the men retreat in coverage. The, the remaining men rush the quarterback. And that way, you kind of deceive the offense as to how many men's really coming after the ball carrier. So Hank had a lot of innovations in football. And that's why it was so great that he finally got inducted into Pro Football Hall of Fame two years ago. Long overdue. And plus, as you know, he was a heck of a good announcer. That's, you better believe it. So, yeah, but I tell you what, following Saints football in my life has been really great, uh, especially with the alumni. I've made a ton of friends helping guys out, especially if they've lost past footage from when they played. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've really got to know a lot of these guys off the record pretty well. And, uh, yeah, I guess you can say New Orleans Saints football has really made me a better person. Okay. How, how much longer on Haslett's contract? It runs through to the end of 2006. Okay. So he's got two years left to go. So it wouldn't surprise me if things fell apart this year, which I hope does not happen, that he could easily be, be let go and financially wouldn't be a big burden on the team. So, you know, what really has surprised me is, you know, you know, during this offseason, we've heard a lot about how much better will the team be. And we've also heard a lot about the negotiations between the state and the Saints, which for now is basically going to be in limbo to the end of the season. Uh, but what's interesting is they've only sold 31,000 season tickets. I figured, you know, I, I think a good number would be at least 45. And they think they might get to 35 before the season starts. So... That's definitely been a disappointment so far this year that more season tickets haven't been sold. Now, what is it with, with Benson? Are, are coaches, is Benson tough to get along with? I mean, does he want to, does he want to be coach? What is the problem? No, no. Oh, oh, Tom, I can guarantee you, Tom Benson has never, ever wanted to be coach, and I don't think he's ever wanted to be general manager. Well, does he let the coach do what the coach is supposed to do? Usually, yeah. Yeah, I do believe that. Then he, he, what's wrong? Why, well, why are we still where we are? <laughs> well, I think partially is uh, not so much the contracts. Because like I said, every day or most, every, most days, Mr. Benson always talks to his GM, Mickey Loomis, mm -hmm. as well as uh, you know, some of the other administrators with the team. And you know, a lot of guys you know, have gotten good money being with the Saints. I think the reason why the Saints have been in the doldrums the last few years is because of uh, personnel decisions that have been made and some coaching decisions, some on-field decisions. You know, for example, 2002, we were on the doorstep of the playoffs going into the last game yep. against uh, Carolina, right. and Aaron Brooks had struggled horribly the previous week against Cincinnati. But, 
you know, Haz was the, was the kind of man, he says, look, I'm sticking with my guy no matter what. And unfortunately, his loyalty to Brooks in 2002 may have alienated some other players, and as a result, it wound up costing the Saints a playoff berth in 02. Mm-hmm. 03 and 04, they've basically been what they are, and that is a 500 ball team, 8-8. Eight and, eight. and I think the last two years, not just so much coaching decisions, but personnel decisions have cost the Saints just enough to get into the playoffs those two years. Yeah, so it, de- it definitely, I don't think it's been so mm-hmm. much Tom Benson's fault with the finances. Okay. It's been more coaching decisions. All right, we come back. I just have one more question for you, William Taylor. Mm-hmm. That is, if Tom Benson called you and said, William, I've got all the money in the world, and I want the perfect coach, who mm-hmm. would you suggest? Okay. We'll find out when we come back. Right. Louisiana Live will continue. All right, let's give uh, William one of our uh, MetalPlus.com Quiz of the Day questions. Okay. How uh, about the number two? What former sitcom star won a Best Actor Academy Award for his role in the 1974 flick, Harry and Tonto? That's an easy one. Danny Ooh. Thomas, Jackie Gleason, Dick Van Dyke, or Art Carney? Art Carney. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Both agree. I got it right, mm-hmm. too. Very good. We're a trio of smart folks here. Hey, Ruffy boys. Yeah, Patty Laverne and Maxine have nothing on us, I'll tell you. All right, who would be the perfect coach? Man, money's that, money's no no problem. That's a tough one because it depends on who's available. Well, let's say anybody's available. Okay. One guy who I wish they would have considered some years ago who had a lot of success in the Canadian Football League who, who I thought would have been interesting was Don Matthews. Don Matthews, a uh, very respected coach in Canada, and I realize it is a different game from the NFL, but I've always in the back of my mind wondered what he could have done in the NFL game. Mm-hmm. You know, I definitely think he would have brought open a much more wide-open offense. Uh, defensively, I'm not quite sure. But if, if I wanted a defensive-minded coach, there was a guy on Mike Ditka's staff who I really admired who was very honest with people, and that was Avon Eularian. I really thought if, if he could have had range of this team with, with no influence from Mike Ditka, that for sure we would have had a darn good above-average defensive team. So I don't think necessarily I would have gone after an established head coach. So a guy who I really like, who's going to be a rookie coach this year, he's in San Francisco, Mike Nolan. Very good defensive coordinator in the NFL for years. That's yeah. a, oh, I would have, I would have mm-hmm. fainted if the Saints could have got him as head coach. So you wouldn't have suggested a Nick Saban? Oh, listen, he would have been super, but I really don't know if he really wanted to come to New Orleans. Well, we don't care if they want to come. This oh, is, I see. No, well, this is just okay. fantasy land. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. I, I think in terms of personality and ability to lead people, uh, yeah, he, he, he would have been outstanding mm-hmm. in New Orleans. If, just like in Miami, if he would have mostly, most of the control of the football side of the team with his thumbprint on everything, I think it would have been a great opportunity uh, for the fans in New Orleans to have him here. When was the last time Tom took you sailing on his yacht? Oh, no, you know, I've never got an invitation. Really? Yeah. Oh, shucks. I thought you had. In fact, the closest chance I had was, uh, you know, him and I could have rode the pedal boats in City Park, but, <laughs> but I had to pay. So. What do you think of this year's bumper sticker? Isn't that kind of like, there's nothing else left but faith? Yeah. That's about all we got, really. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's really kind of depressing, but kind of factual. Yeah, and that's why I thought it was so apropos. Mm-hmm. When I first saw the TV commercials running for it, I, I really thought, hey, that, that's appropriate. I think that's going to stick with a lot of ironic yeah, stick, yeah. It, stick it, people this year. It was honest, and it struck right at home. And the other commercial you might have seen them run is about, you know, the Saints fan in the waiting, lo- waiting room. Missed that one. Okay. Around him are fans of other teams who struggled for years before winning a title. Mm-hmm. And the very last five seconds, a Saints fan and a Cubs fan. And all of a sudden, the PA comes on, and that's it. That's where the commercial is. Oh, boy. So, who knows? So we write our own ending to that one. Yeah. All right. William, as always, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. All righty. And go Saints. Let's hope so. Just right. stay here. Don't go elsewhere. All right. And, Emily, you can just stall your sorry butt out there in the middle of the water somewhere. We don't want to have to worry about another one. All right. Coming up in the next hour. a.m. KTIB. It's 5.20 p.m. Live from the Fruited Plain, it is Green Street in beautiful downtown Thibodeau. 
William Taylor coming at you here at 521. Along with me. Friday. Yeah, there, now we can hear you. It's Friday. I'm so happy. It's Friday. That, are you going to copyright that? What? That song. I'm so happy. It's Friday. I think you got a good jingle there. If oh, you, yeah. If you could sell it to Applebee's or something, you'd be in great shape. So. But it's Friday. So okay. what are you doing this weekend, William? Well, got to shovel more sawdust. Okay, besides shoveling sawdust. Mm-hmm. Well, when Daddy comes back from Mississippi, I'll have to help him unload his saw. So that, that'll get pretty exciting. You, you don't have, like, any crazy, wild thing planned for this weekend? Uh, well, I remember one weekend I did run my head into a goalpost. That was a lot of fun. It explains why I turned out the way I did. But you know. uh -huh. So that's about as wild and crazy as I've gotten in my life. I did go bowling two weeks ago. What? Yeah. Oh, come on. It's Friday. It's, you know, it's going to be cool this week, and it's probably going to rain a little. Uh, well, it's going to rain a little. Uh, the I good... guarantee it's going to rain, but at least the temperature is going to be a lot nicer than it has been. The rain well, today, cool look at today. We, we in Thibodeau didn't get much rain, but the cloud cover from other showers really has kept it nice and tolerable. Yeah, it's been nice. It's been really nice, but we do have the two systems in the Gulf we have to think about. Well, no, no, no. One system in the One southeast system. Gulf. And then a second one. You check to see if another mic's on by any chance, Jason, because I seem to be getting some background uh, indications in there. Mm. And uh, but that's it, main feed. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, while you do that, the second system is on the east side of the Bahamas. Okay. Not in the Gulf. That's moving northwest. It'll affect the eastern seaboard. All right. Okay. The thing in the southeast Gulf is very disorganized, very unorganized, and the way it looks right now is that the um, for lack of a better word, it's probably going to stay unorganized for at least maybe 24 hours if it decides to reorganize itself later on. So that's the way things look right now with that system.